In this video, we combine some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies that have happened in Australia that we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt, to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. The first two stories of this cave diving marathon happened in Tank Cave. Tank Cave got its name from a water tank that sits directly on top of the entrance. It's located in Mount Gambier, South Australia. To enter the cave, you have to climb down a short ladder because the entrance is underground. The Cave Divers Association of Australia strictly controls access to this entrance. Tank Cave is a rare gem, and diving through it gives divers joy. The cave, which has a small surface, leads to an extensive maze-like system with over 23,000 feet 7, meters of passage that cavers can dive through. It also has numerous side channels. The cave is relatively shallow. Its maximum depth is around 65 feet 20 meters. Its water is crystal clear. You can dive through the water with utmost clarity and little or no hindrance. Tank Cave is one of the longest underwater caves in Australia, and a fixed line runs throughout most of the cave. However, one prominent feature made the cave dangerous. The system of the cave is quite complicated. It looks like a wild spider web. To guard against mishaps, cave divers must go through a step-by-step -step guide to familiarize themselves with the cave before they are given access. All diving protocols must be properly adhered to for a successful dive in Tank Cave. It's amazing to know that many things have been discovered in Tank Cave, yet there is still endless exploration to be done. It's just like the old saying, the more you look into this cave, the less you see. As you go deeper into this cave, you will begin to discover that there is more to know about it. Divers who are up for an interesting yet dangerous adventure always visit the cave. This is because the cave had tight restrictions and it could get hard to see while inside due to the limited body space available. Some parts of the cave are so enclosed that some explorers may be required to pull their tanks before they can pass through without hindrance. The enclosed nature of the cave is not so great because the insides of the cave roof and wall are so soft and squishy. Therefore, big roof parts fall on divers as they breathe air. This disrupts the clarity of the water, resulting in an inability to see clearly. Agnes Mylauka was a woman of passion and an international cave explorer. She was born on December 23, 1981 in Australia. Agnes was a highly qualified diver with certifications such as Potty Open Water, Advanced Open Water and Rescue, CDAA Advanced Cave, TDI Advanced Trimix, and much more. She never wanted to be a technical diver, but she said everything happened spontaneously. Her passion took her into the deepest waters and caves and she experienced the best of her feelings and she became a technical diver. Furthermore, she was an underwater photographer, author, maritime archaeologist, and cave explorer. Agnes was part of many international diving projects and documentaries. It wasn't a surprise that Agnes gained international recognition as a diver because she always launched into deeper cave systems across Australia and Florida. She went far beyond the places other divers had previously gone, and she was always successful at it. She was also a public speaker and author in her profession of diving and maritime archaeology. Agnes's life journey revealed that she was dedicated to her passion. During the summer of 2007, Agnes completed an internship program at St. Augustine, Florida with the Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program, LAMP, which was the research house of St. Augustine Lighthouse and Museum. Agnes participated in the archaeological excavation of historic shipwreck sites. This work introduced her to Florida diving, where she explored extensive cave systems. 
Cave exploration became more of an obsession for Agnes because she was constantly captivated by the sight of unknown passages and where they led to. She was known for exploring, mapping new cave systems, pushing boundaries, and most importantly, returning home with images from her adventures. She displayed these images to the world so they could have a look at what their own eyes couldn't have seen. The Gliders University graduate Agnes Miloka was drawn into the world of cave diving after seeing a hole at the bottom of Piccaninny Ponds near Mount Gambier in 2004. Agnes and James Arendale explored the Elk River Streamway cave system. It has 4,600 feet 1400 meters of passages. This cave has the potential to become the longest continuous stream passage in Victoria, Australia. Agnes had the record for the longest cave dive in Australia for a female after she reached the midpoint of Craig Challen's 2008 line on an expedition near Cucklebitty in 2009. She worked with some TV channels, such as Discovery Channel Japan and the National Geographic Nova TV Expedition in 2008. And in 2009, she was part of the expedition that looked for sinkholes in Queensland, Australia. Agnes also worked on the National Geographic magazine expedition to the Bahamas Caves as a photographic assistant. She laid more than 13,000 feet, 4,000 meters of line across several cave systems, the most significant of which was Baptizing Spring, aka Mission. She and James Tolan added more than 9,800 feet, 3,000 meters, to make the connection between Peacock Springs and Baptizing Spring. Because of her passion, she started a TV series called Agnes Mylauka Project, where she featured underwater cave footage shot by Wedge Smiles and Karst Productions. She worked as a cave dive instructor to the actors during the production of James Cameron's film. She won the award of Dive Right Ambassador in 2011. And lastly, she worked for the Trimapi fashion label in their short film titled Birth as a Diving Supervisor. The movie was dedicated in her name to honor her demise. Before the tank cave incident, Agnes had an interview with the Polish radio station. When she was asked if the death of a fellow diver scared her a little, she replied, I am not scared of diving. Anyone at any point can pass away. So you have to live your life as if tomorrow could be your last day. I love diving. I am passionate about it. And I don't think anything will stop me from doing it. Unfortunately, there are risks. In every extreme sport, there are dangers. It doesn't always work out, but you do everything possible to not only do that one dive, but to keep on diving over many years. That's what it's all about, after all. Longevity. You have to dive safely, but live as if every day is going to be your last. This shows the heart of a woman that even the fear of death couldn't stop her from her passion, and she lived true to it, till her last breath in diving. After getting to hear about the unfortunate incident, many would conclude that it was Agnes's first time in the tank cave. However, it wasn't. She had explored the tank cave several times in the past, and she also wrote about the cave system, calling it the crowning jewel of all the caves in the region. However, she stated that the cave system was so complicated that it could be likened to a spider web gone wild. This, in essence, was to warn intending cave divers to be extremely careful while navigating the Tank Cave. During her expedition to Tank Cave, which she tweeted about on Friday, February 25, 2011, Agnes was exploring the extensive labyrinth of caves. Agnes ran out of air and suffocated after she became disoriented. Her body was found about 1,800 feet 550 meters away from the entrance submerged under 66 feet 20 meters of water in a tight section of cave, but she was not trapped before her death. Agnes died as a result of the silt she stirred up from the cave walls and floor after she got separated from her diving partner. It was as if she remained calm until her last breath while she was trying to extricate herself. She couldn't see anything and was unable to get out of the cave before she ran out of air. 
Her death could also have been a result of her aggression in the winding and narrow tunnels after diving into a very narrow, rocky passage, which took divers about an hour to reach. She was left alone because the place she dove into couldn't occupy two divers at a time. Consequently, it's not against the rules to dive by yourself under these certain conditions. The victim was reported missing at about 1.45 p.m. on Sunday, February 27. Her fellow divers worked very hard before they could recover her body. A video of the path she took was recorded, which gave the retriever team the hope of finding her body without drilling through the earth above, as some suggested. The divers paired themselves using a guideline from the entrance of the cave. They positioned emergency tanks along the path they found to their deceased friend. Several hours after the missing report, her body was recovered about 1,970 feet, 600 meters into the cave system by the retriever team, which included her diving buddy, Dr. Harris. Lucas Major's journey into cave diving started with a tragedy. At the young age of 16, he lost his best friend in a cave diving accident an incident that left him traumatized. Determined to never find himself in such a situation, Lucas registered for a cave diving course to learn the necessary skills to explore caves safely. During his time at college in the United States, Lucas became friends with Matt Parker, his roommate and a fellow cave diving enthusiast. The two quickly bonded over their shared passion and this marked the beginning of a friendship that would last for many years. While both were avid cave divers, Lucas was the more adventurous and daring of the two, always seeking out new and exciting challenges. Together, Lucas and Matt went on countless diving expeditions to explore the many cave systems of the United States. Their adventures took them to some of the most stunning and remote locations, where they uncovered the beauty of the underwater world. In a thrilling adventure of a lifetime, Lucas Major and Matt Parker embarked on a journey to the heart of Australia. Their mission? To attend a groundbreaking seminar near the famous Mount Gambier. But this was just the beginning of their epic adventure. After the seminar, Lucas proposed they take a detour and explore the legendary Tank Cave. Matt, always up for an adventure, eagerly agreed, and they drafted out a plan. Their dive was with a strict time limit, and they had planned not to go too deep because nitrogen narcosis becomes a hazard below 100 feet. Nitrogen narcosis is a drowsy feeling experienced by divers, caused by high-pressure air. It can make divers feel drunk and impair judgment, which is extremely dangerous when diving in deep water. When diving below 100 feet, divers should use Trimix which is a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium to help in narcosis reduction because the tank contains a lower percentage of nitrogen. Since Lucas and Matt were not equipped with Trimix, they planned not to dive below 100 feet. At exactly 8 a.m., they suited up and dove into the waters of Tank Cave. As they descended into the unknown, they marveled at the stunning beauty of the underwater scenery, but their excitement was short-lived as they stumbled upon a narrow tunnel. Lucas was initially unable to squeeze through the restriction, but he waited patiently as Matt struggled to pass through. With a deep breath and fierce determination, Lucas stretched his hands forward and managed to pass through the tight squeeze. Their exploration continued as they followed the line for almost 25 feet, discovering some passages and territories along the way. The line continued ahead, beckoning them to explore further. Lucas and Matt dove further. As they continued their journey, Lucas led the way, and they eventually stumbled upon a section that was a side-mount-only passage. Depending on their size, they might have to remove one tank to pass through the initial restriction, making the dive much more challenging than they had anticipated. The walls and roof of the passage were soft and squishy, causing large chunks to rain down on them as they exhaled, quickly reducing visibility to zero. Despite these difficulties, they persevered and explored further until they dived into the agreed 100-foot section. Lucas couldn't believe his eyes as he gazed upon the breathtaking scenery surrounding him. He had been gently exploring this section when Matt tapped him on the shoulder, signaling that it was time to exit. However, just as they were about to make their ascent, 
Lucas caught sight of another passageway and made a spur-of-the-moment decision to explore it. Matt, on the other hand, was not on board with Lucas's sudden change of plans and reminded him of the importance of sticking to their initial plan. The two had a heated exchange, but despite Matt's objections, Lucas remained resolute in his decision to explore the uncharted passageway. Reluctantly, Matt made his way toward the only exit point, which was the passage that required side mount diving. However, as he made his ascent and exited the water, he realized that Lucas was nowhere in sight. Panic set in as Matt realized that almost 40 minutes had passed and Lucas had not yet ascended. Without hesitation, Matt alerted the authorities and told them what happened. Rescue divers were quickly called in to search for Lucas. As the minutes passed, the situation grew tense. Matt couldn't just keep waiting for the rescue divers to arrive. Lucky for him, they brought an extra gas tank, so he ran to their truck and suited up to go back into the cave. Determined to find his friend, Matt plunged back into the waters. It was a risky move, but he knew that he had to do everything in his power to find Lucas and bring him back to safety. Initially, he had optimistic thoughts that he would run into his friend while on his way, but to his dismay, he failed to come across him. Therefore, he proceeded to the spot where he had last seen Lucas. However, he was greeted with a distressing and sorrowful sight that broke his heart into pieces. His friend was trapped in the tight passageway they had encountered earlier, and his body was firmly wedged in place, with half in front and half behind. Apparently, Lucas had been stuck in the passageway while attempting to exit, and despite his attempts, he could not free himself. Due to the prolonged struggle and effort to break free, he had grown weak and depleted his air reserve, leaving him gasping for breath. Matt tried his best to keep Lucas conscious and awake, but Lucas was losing consciousness continually. The state in which he found his friend filled Matt with guilt and remorse for leaving him behind. He attempted to remove him from the narrow passage, but he was unsuccessful with his efforts. In an attempt to comfort him, he whispered words of encouragement, telling him he needed to seek help. However, Lucas was barely responsive, making it difficult for Matt to understand his situation. Eventually, after realizing he could do little to help his friend, Matt decided to return to the surface. As he left his friend behind, he felt guilty and unsure whether Lucas would survive the ordeal. The doubts and guilt that engulfed him were overwhelming, making him question his decision to leave his friend behind. Upon his ascent to the surface, Matt saw that a rescue team consisting of three divers had assembled, but they were awaiting the arrival of the lead rescue diver, who was expected to be there in five minutes. Matt briefed the team on where he had last seen Lucas and his condition. While he was speaking, the team leader arrived and began to gear up. Although Matt expressed a desire to accompany the team, they advised him to wait since he was distressed and panicked. As the divers entered the water, Matt took the initiative to contact Lucas's parents and inform them about the situation, assuring them that a rescue team was on its way. In the meantime, the rescue divers arrived at the location where Lucas was stuck and assessed the situation. They realized that they needed to work systematically to push him back into the section he was coming from to extract him from the tight space. One of the smaller divers on the team entered the tight space and removed Lucas's side mount before passing it to the other divers who helped pull him out. After 45 minutes of intense effort, the team finally emerged from the water with Lucas's body. The cave was filled with sorrow as Matt wept inconsolably, regretting their decision to embark on the ill-fated adventure. A diver's promising life had been lost due to a deviation from their dive plan. This tragic incident serves as a reminder that our desires may not always align with what is reasonable. What may appear thrilling can easily turn into a catastrophe. As a result, it is crucial to prioritize following your dive plan and adhering to safety measures. Let this incident serve as a motivating factor to always prioritize safety and be vigilant in the face of potentially dangerous situations.
As far back as 1938, in Thompson's Paddock, a cave was discovered on farmland close to the eastern part of Allendale, a few kilometers south of Mount Gambier, Australia. The name of the cave is The Shaft. It was discovered when some horses were grazing on the field and one of them slipped into a hole of about one foot in diameter. For the sake of further exploration, the surface of this newly discovered hole has been widened to about 3.3 feet in diameter. It was never known that it was an opening to a larger underground cavern until divers began to explore it. A local diver came to this field in the mid-1960s, and to his greatest surprise, as he descended into the small hole, he arrived at a wide lake cave with a depth of about 56 feet. He began to go deeper until he reached a depth of about 69 feet. The main cavern is about 460 feet in length and has a width of about 260 feet. If you enter the cave, the water level is mostly about 23 feet below the ground level. There's a rock pile down there inside the cave. You'll see it directly under the cave's entrance. Two tunnels extend further into the cave from the area around the rock pile. To the east, the tunnel is about 407 feet deep, and to the northwest, the other tunnel is 260 feet deep. If you go to the shaft to dive, it's not like other caves where you can go in together with your equipment. You and your equipment have to be separately lowered down into the cave with a lift system. The exploration and mapping that was done between 2002 and 2003 showed that the eastern tunnel has some barriers at about 187 feet that limit further exploration into the cave. But if you go beyond the barrier, the tunnel extends to a depth of about 407 feet. From this point, the tunnel becomes horizontal and is blocked by another rock pile. The name shaft was claimed to have originated from the sparkling shaft of sunlight that reflects on the ground from the surface during sunny days. On May 26, 1973, a team of nine divers came for a cave diving adventure at the shaft. The divers were Christine Mallott, Glenn Mallott, Stephen Mallott, John Bockerman, Larry Reynolds, Gordon Roberts, Peter Burr, Joan Harper, and Robert Smith. Joan Harper had told the other eight members of the team that she would stay above the surface while she prepared hot soup for them and help them with any other things they needed. So on May 27, 1973, the eight divers made a pre-exploratory dive into the cave. They fixed a guideline from the entrance down into the cave to about 150 feet into the water. They got to the rock pile that is directly under the entrance to the cave. It's a pile of limestone rubble that is 131 feet high. They explored the circumference of the rock pile, after which they returned to the surface with the guideline they had earlier fixed to the entrance. The final exploration was scheduled for the following day. On May 28, 1973, the eight divers entered the water to explore the underground cave, as they had planned the previous day. They had refilled their cylinders at Mount Gambier. Within a short time, they got to the rock pile, which they had explored the previous day. Initially, they didn't plan to exceed the edge, which is an extension of the main cavern whose slope is narrow and goes downward. The area beyond this region no longer has the natural light penetration that comes from the entrance. The rock pile happened to be the safety limit for recreational diving because the other parts of the cave are yet to be explored and are filled with silt and limestone debris. Diving to a greater depth will cause divers to be more susceptible to nitrogen narcosis unless they have a mixture of helium in their cylinders. The eight divers violated a lot of safety rules. Their guideline didn't go far into the floor of the cave. They had no staging tank clipped to the guideline for decompression while returning, no gas management plan for their dive, and no predetermined diving buddy. Glenn Millard, one of the divers, later explained that going into such a narrow cave with eight guidelines might have posed greater dangers than they encountered. Robert Smith, who dove in this cave about eight times, said that he was not expecting the dive to have gotten to such great depths, especially for other members of the team. Robert began to feel the effect of nitrogen narcosis when he got to the base of the rock pile. Nitrogen narcosis sometimes occurs in this region, but is not as strong as going further into the cave. From his depth gauge, he discovered that he had already gone 180 feet deep inside the cave. Being a skilled diver and being acquainted with narcosis symptoms, he indicated to the other divers that he was returning to the top of the rock pile. Others indicated back to him that they were going further into the cave. 
After spending a few minutes around the base of the rock pile, Robert saw Glenn coming from the passageway where he had seen others go, so they met at the rock pile. Glenn had kept an eye on the level of his air, and when he discovered that it had reached the limit to start returning, he turned back. While he was about to turn his dive, he sighted Christine. He was about to take her by the arm to inform her that he was returning to the surface, but she swam away before he could reach her. Both Robert and Glenn returned to the surface together. While getting to the surface, they saw Larry, who had surfaced before them. Just within the blink of an eye, Peter also surfaced with his tank almost empty. Glenn immediately took a spare tank and dove back into the water because he knew that the remaining four divers would be running out of air. He found Steven's torch and camera at a depth of 225 feet, and the visibility was almost zero because the area was already silted out. Glenn had to return to the surface because he couldn't go any further due to the visibility problem. When he got back to the surface, he met an ambulance that the divers who were on the surface had called for because of the emergency. Peter also went back into the cave in the hope of finding any of them, but that wasn't possible either. At this time, they all realized that the other four divers had no chance of surviving in the cave. Robert and Larry saw both Christine and Gordon trying to get back to the rock pile from the depth they dove into, but they dove straight up, thinking they could find a way out much faster since they would have been running out of air. Unfortunately, they found themselves in a dome with no exit. That was the only time Robert and Larry could see the two of them. John was also seen to be under a strong nitrogen narcosis attack, as he was seen just diving further down into the cave. It's likely he didn't know he was going to die. On May 29, 1973, the police underwater recovery team dove into the cave and got to a depth of about 200 feet. It was a short search operation because they'd reached their diving limits, so none of the divers' bodies were found. On May 30th, they continued the search, which also proved abortive. So the police had to go for scheduled training from skilled naval officers, which will last for many months before they can return for the search. In the year following, on January 22, 1974, a television film crew came to the site for cave diving. They dove into different caves that were in the lower southeast. So the crew dove to a depth of about 50 feet with a more sophisticated light, which turned the entire cave into broad daylight. One of the crew members, from where he was, looked into the distance to see that there seemed to be a third person behind two of his two dive teams. They later found out that it was a dead body in a wetsuit. So they returned to the surface and reported what they had seen in the cave. The following day, very early in the morning, the police divers came to the cave and dove to the depth reported by this crew. They found the body lying there at a depth of 50 feet, and they hauled it out. After a dental record identification, the body was discovered to be Stephen Malott, whose torch and the camera were found at a greater depth during the incident. When the police returned to the surface from their dive to a depth of 180 feet, no other body of the remaining three divers was found. On March 9, 1974, a team of divers, together with RG Trainer, went into the cave. They entered with approved diving gear, which could make the recovery more successful. Trainer saw a body at a depth of 185 feet. He discovered that it was not just one body, but two, the second underneath the first. It was later found out that the two bodies were those of Christine and Gordon, who were seen last diving together during the incident. They were found below each other. It must have been that they both held each other when they discovered that they wouldn't escape the death that had knocked on their doors. The same day, as Trainer went further into the cave, about 20 feet away from where the others were found, he saw another body under a rock ledge. The body was discovered to be John Bockerman. Trainer returned to the surface because he was now running out of air and couldn't even gather the bodies together at a place where they could conveniently bring them out, as he had initially thought. On March 10, 1974, the divers returned to the cave to bring the bodies out but that wasn't possible with all their efforts because of the murky waters. They suspended the operation until the next day. Lastly, Christine Malott and Gordon Roberts' bodies were brought to the surface on March 11, 1974. They began to feel the symptoms of nitrogen narcosis at the depth where they found the other two bodies, so they had to return from the dive. 
The body of John Bockerman was still lying 215 feet into the cave when they aborted the recovery operation. The divers were given a month's break to recover from the stress and for further training to prepare for the last recovery at the shaft cave system. A three-day recovery operation was scheduled for the recovery of the last body. On the first day, they went into the cave with guidelines to figure out the exact location of the body. On the second day, they rested from the possible effects of nitrogen narcosis, though the effects could fade within a few minutes after resurfacing. So on the third day, they went back into the cave and recovered the body. They had symptoms of nitrogen narcosis on the two days they had the dive. The recovery operation was successful because they used advanced equipment, followed safety procedures, and planned the dive well. It wasn't until April 9, 1974 that they were able to recover the body of John Bockerman. His body had spent 11 months and 11 days in the cave since the accident on May 28, 1973. Two incidents, one location, the Killsby Sinkhole. 18-year-olds Patrick and Brett decided to go the Killsby Sinkhole for a leisurely dive with their friends. They descended into the cave, and when the next diver tried to follow them, the safety line disappeared. 41 years later, a 52-year-old health practitioner was diving with his friend when he developed breathing problems 104 feet below. Located on a picturesque sheep farm amidst the stunning rolling countryside of South Australia, just eight miles south of Mount Gambier, lies the Killsby Sinkhole, a naturally occurring karst sinkhole that has been used for recreational diving as well as civilian and police diver training since the late 1960s. This unique geological feature offers a wealth of experiences for divers of all levels making it an ideal location for adventure seekers. Hillsby Cave, which is classified as a sinkhole dive, is theoretically the easiest level for divers and is mostly used for beginner dives. It's easily accessible thanks to its open cabin area. Reports indicate that about 1,000 dives are conducted at the sinkhole every year, making it a popular diving location for the past 40 years. The sinkhole offers clear water and allows divers to descend up to 131 feet below the surface, which adds to its allure. However, the sinkhole also has many twists and turns, which makes it notoriously dangerous. One of the biggest risks is that someone or something could end up anywhere within the system, making the recovery process quite lengthy. Despite these risks, divers continue to be drawn to the Killsby sinkhole thanks to its unique geological features and exciting diving experiences. The 18-year-olds, Brett and Patrick, were relatively new to diving when they decided to venture down to Mount Gambier with a group of friends, including George and Carrie, to engage in some pleasurable diving. While George had previously gone diving with Brett and Pat in the sinkhole the day before, he had to surface early due to ear problems. Despite George's setback, the group was still eager to continue their diving adventure. They had made a successful dive to 180 feet. After the exhilarating experience, they attended a late-night dance, making for a long and exciting day. On April 6, 1969, a group of 10 individuals consisting of three scuba divers, four snorkelers, and three non-diving friends arrived at the sinkhole at precisely 11 a.m. Four of the group members had intended to engage in a snorkeling activity around the cave, while the remaining three individuals, Brett and Pat, were set to undertake a deep dive and George was to take photographs near the surface of the sinkhole. George, one of the group members, had issued a warning to the others about not diving too deep due to their lack of experience and the lack of essential equipment such as watches and twin scuba cylinders, which were critical for their safety. However, despite George's warning, the group felt confident enough to engage in the deep dive as they had completed a similar dive the previous day. Furthermore, the group expressed the not-so-wise intention of wanting to scratch their names on the cave's wall, which was located at a depth of approximately 196 feet. This objective was especially reckless given their lack of experience, their overweight condition, and the absence of essential equipment required for the dive. 
After taking some photos on the surface of the main lake, they began their descent. As they descended, they took one end of a 164-foot safety rope with them, while their companion held the other end at the surface. Carrie observed as Brett and Pat reached the bottom at a depth of approximately 91 feet. They stopped for a minute on the dark silt slope to secure their end of the safety line to a large boulder. They then proceeded to move horizontally into the extensive cave located to the southwest of the entrance lake. Shortly after, the safety line became tight and the surface end was released so they could pull it in behind them. George had the intention of following the safety line down, but he faced an issue as he tried to tie his camera to the rope ladder. The safety line had vanished by then. After descending to a depth of roughly 98 feet, he discovered their line fastened to a boulder, but didn't spot any sign of his companions when he peered into the dark and murky cavern beyond. Although he decided to wait for a few minutes, his apprehension increased when his companions failed to return, even after five minutes had elapsed. Therefore, he ascended to the surface and conversed with Carrie about his concerns, which led to his decision to dive again for as long as he could. When George went down once more, he activated his backup air supply as he reached a depth of 98 feet. He arrived at the tie-off boulder and examined the line once more, but he couldn't spot any movement in the dark, clear water. He realized that time was running out and he was low on air, so he resolved to return to the surface. However, he saw something gleaming in the corner of his eye, approximately 32 feet to the left of the main line in the chamber as he turned to go up. As George swam across the dark and chilly waters, his eyes caught a faint light flickering in the distance. He recognized it as a torch and swam closer, hoping to find his diving companions safe and sound. However, as he approached, a harrowing sight met his eyes. He saw one of his fellow divers lying lifelessly on his back, with no sign of movement or breath. And a few meters away lay the second diver, also in a motionless state. George's heart sank as he realized that they were both dead. Overwhelmed with shock and disbelief, George's mind raced, and he knew that he had to act fast. His first instinct was to swim up to the surface, and he turned around and swam back as fast as he could. With his heart pounding and his lungs screaming for air, he broke through the surface just as his breath was about to give out. Gasping for air, he quickly informed the others of the tragic turn of events. Although they were all devastated and saddened by the loss of their fellow divers, they knew they had to do something to help. They were far from any assistance, and the only option was to exit the hole and go for help. It took a skilled diver with approximately six years of experience, along with the help of others, three hours to recover the lifeless bodies of Pat and Brett. Despite the long wait, the victims' torches were still glowing. Pat's gear had sustained severe damage, with the loss of his mask, torch, snorkel, knife, and one fin. However, his cylinder still contained about 700 psi of air, and his buoyancy vest had not been inflated, even though he was still wearing his weight belt. In contrast, all of Brett's gear was intact, but his scuba cylinder was empty. He was using a twin hose regulator, and during the recovery operation, it was seen to vent itself for approximately two minutes. The post-mortem examination was carried out by a local doctor, and during the coroner's inquest in May 1969, he stated, In my opinion, death was the result of air embolism due to decompression. The doctor also said that he believed that Pat and Brett had died of drowning and vasovagal inhibition. What seemed to have happened is that the divers lost track of their bottom time and air supplies while under the influence of nitrogen narcosis, leading to their running out of air. The tragedy underscores the importance of proper training and adherence to safe diving practices. Nitrogen narcosis is a serious issue that can infect even the most experienced divers, and it's critical to remain vigilant and mindful of one's surroundings at all times. It's a sobering reminder of the dangers inherent in diving and the need to take every possible precaution to ensure a safe and enjoyable diving experience.
Dr. Robert McAllister, 52, along with his friend, went on a dive in the Killsby sinkhole on March 13, 2010. He was a proficient diver and a health professional residing in the eastern suburb of Langmarin. Robert's wife, Robin McAllister, provided him with support on his many diving adventures. He had a fondness for cave diving, especially in Mount Gambier where he followed strict safety protocols and maintained his equipment with almost military precision. These trips were a yearly highlight for him, allowing him to immerse himself in his passion for the subterranean world. Although Robert's co-diver and friend was not as experienced, he was a regular dive companion. The previous day, Robert had completed a successful dive in a different location near Mount Gambier. However, on this specific occasion, he was utilizing new equipment that he was not accustomed to. Robert and his friend were having a good time diving at the sinkhole, descending to a depth of approximately 104 feet. During the dive, Robert's friend noticed that he was in distress and made an attempt to help him out of the situation. However, a brief struggle ensued between the two as Robert pulled off his mask and mouthpiece in an attempt to access his friend's equipment. As the altercation continued, Robert became increasingly aggressive and began to grasp at his friend's mask and equipment, which made it impossible for them to engage in the buddy breathing technique that is typically used in such situations. This created an even more tense atmosphere as Robert's friend realized that he needed to take action before the situation resulted in both of them becoming fatalities. As he watched his friend struggle to breathe at such depths, Robert's friend became traumatized and overwhelmed with a feeling of helplessness, knowing that there was very little he could do to assist his friend in this dire situation. The entire experience left him shaken and affected him deeply. As soon as he emerged from the water's surface, he promptly alerted the emergency services of his situation and subsequently received care for shock from paramedics present at the scene. Following this, he proceeded to inform the police of the incident, and this was around 12.15 p.m. The distressing and traumatic experience he had just undergone was undeniably harrowing and distressing for him. The following day, members of the South Australia Police Underwater Recovery Unit from Adelaide prepared for the body recovery and dived into the depths of the water to a maximum depth of approximately 164 feet. After an extensive search, the recovery team eventually discovered the deceased body of Robert, who was found to be entangled in the cave's guide ropes. There are conflicting reports regarding whether his death was a result of being entangled in the guide ropes and if his friend attempted to assist him in freeing himself. Some divers are puzzled by his failure to cut the ropes to extricate himself, assuming that's what happened. The fact that the other diver left suggests that he may have been low on air, as he would have otherwise stayed nearby in case his buddy needed assistance. While medical problems are a possibility, it's unlikely that they occurred at the same time as the entanglement, if that was indeed the issue. All of this is speculation, but some accidents are more perplexing than others, and we can only guess what happened. The news of Dr. McAllister's passing came as a shock to many due to his reputation as a selfless caregiver who dedicated himself to helping the sick, one of which was that he provided medical care to one family for 26 years, spanning four generations and playing a vital role in the establishment of the Frankston Sexual Health Clinic located south of Melbourne. In the heart of a vast pine forest, a team of four divers embarked on an exploratory mission in a small water-filled cave called the Death Cave. As they swam through the shallow waters, their curiosity led them to a low passage. Little did they know, the soft, deep mud beneath them was a ticking time bomb. The murky waters turned pitch black, trapping them. With no way out, they were left to fight for their lives in the unknown depths. The Death Cave, which is sometimes referred to as Allen's Cave, is a small sinkhole that contains very clear water, giving it an inviting appearance. It can be found in the pine forest located east of Mount Gambier. The cave has been said to have a depth of approximately 65 feet. 
Upon entering the cave, divers will notice that to the west of the entrance, there is only one relatively open area. This area provides divers with a unique view of the cave's surroundings, including the big boulders and the low, flat passage that extends for some distance. However, as divers venture further into the cave, they will come across a larger cavern that is filled with crystal-clear water. Although this section of the cave has beautiful scenery and an unforgettable experience, the floor of the cavern is entirely covered with soft, deep mud that can easily be disturbed, leading to silting out. As a result, this can greatly reduce visibility for divers and lead to unprecedented fatality. The group of divers in this cave diving expedition includes a diverse range of ages and experience levels. The youngest among them was Ron, a 17-year-old who had been diving for approximately 18 months, along with his 18-year-old counterpart, Sandra, who had a similar level of experience. Christopher, another 17-year-old, had been honing his skills for around two years, making him relatively seasoned compared to Ron and Sandra. The group also included Dave, who at 39 years of age was the most experienced member of the team, having been a diver for a considerable 15 years. Despite their varying levels of experience, there was one particular area of diving in which none of them had much practice, cave diving. While all of them had significant experience in open water diving, the unique set of challenges and risks involved with cave diving was not familiar territory for the group. It was Monday, October 9, 1972, when the group of four divers concluded a weekend of successful club diving in other water-filled sinkholes. As they made their way back to Adelaide, a small cave caught their attention, which they had heard was approximately 65 feet deep. Despite having a long journey ahead of them, they could not resist the urge to take a quick look, and without much contemplation, they entered the water, equipped with full tanks. However, they left their safety guideline, which they usually carried in their car, behind, as they presumed they would not venture too far into the cave. Moreover, they had also been informed that there were no significant underwater extensions branching off from the main entry chamber. For the initial five minutes, the group swam around the shallow parts, exploring the low areas surrounding the walls. Subsequently, they swam down the western side of the primary silt mound and discovered the only relatively open area they could find. It was between some enormous boulders, 19 feet below the surface, where they stumbled upon a low, flat passage that appeared to extend quite some distance. Being the leader of the team, Dave expressed his intention to go in for a short distance to inspect the passage. He made this decision knowing full well that he was without any guidelines to navigate through the cave's twists and turns, putting himself and the entire group at risk. Once Dave ventured into the narrow three-foot-high and nine-foot-wide silty passage, Ron followed suit, and the rest of the group followed behind him. As they swam through the passage, they encountered several constrictions, and after traversing a distance of about 19 feet, they surfaced into a much larger cavern containing crystal clear water. At this point, Ron turned around to keep an eye on the other members, only to notice that their entry passage had become entirely clogged with silt. The movement of their bodies through the soft, deep mud on the passage floor had disturbed it, causing it to cloud the water and reduce visibility. This realization caused him to become deeply concerned, and he suggested that the group not spend much time exploring the chamber. Intending to prevent the silt from entirely obscuring their vision and blocking their exit, the group immediately started looking for an exit passage. They knew that any delay could result in an even more dangerous situation. Regrettably, their efforts to locate the exit were in vain as they had already caused more silt disturbance during their attempt to swim back toward the entrance passage. The disturbed mud rose in a massive cloud, enveloping the entire chamber and plunging it into a darkness so complete they could not even see their torches when held up to their masks. The situation was dire, and the divers were acutely aware that their lives were at risk. Despite this, they remained focused and resolute, determined to find their way out of the silt trap. 
Over the next 30 minutes or so, the group continued to search desperately for the exit, but their efforts were in vain. Amid the chaos, Ron collided with another diver and managed to grasp onto him. Through the murky water, he could discern that the diver was Dave, the team leader. However, they lost contact with each other as they descended together in search of the exit. The situation was dire, and the divers knew they had to remain calm and composed if they had any chance of surviving the ordeal. As Ron desperately searched for a way out of the silt trap, he could hear the sounds of other divers nearby. He heard the tapping of an air cylinder and the distinct sound of a regulator free-flowing, but despite his efforts, he was unable to locate the source of these sounds. At one point, while trying to navigate through a narrow restriction, Ron lost his regulator. Although he was able to retrieve it, time was quickly running out, and Ron was growing increasingly anxious about his chances of survival. Despite the mounting sense of dread, Ron remained resolute and continued to search for the exit. However, as he felt his way along the walls of the cavern, he suddenly found himself struggling to inhale. Panicking, he pulled his reserve air lever, knowing that death was only moments away. But then, in a miraculous turn of events, Ron noticed a faint green light shining overhead. With renewed hope, he swam towards the light and emerged from the water, gasping for air. After informing the surface party about what had happened, Ron attempted to guide the other divers out of the silt by tapping on his cylinder, but to no avail. Despite his efforts, none of the other divers were able to find their way out in time and tragically lost their lives in the cave. On the day after the tragic incident, professional diver Mac Laurie, who happened to be a close friend of Dave, retrieved the bodies of the remaining three divers. The operation was extremely dangerous, and Mac used a hookah with a five-hour air supply. He encountered several difficulties as he got stuck numerous times while he recovered the bodies of Dave, Sandra, and finally Christopher. During the recovery operation, he found Dave's body only a short distance into the cave, whereas Christopher and Sandra were discovered together in a narrow, dead-end passage at the far end of the main chamber which they might have assumed to be the exit passage. As a result of this devastating accident, the cave was eventually closed to sport diving, and it is now secured by a gated block of concrete. The incident was undoubtedly tragic, and it earned Allen's cave the name Death Cave. However, the diver's death could have been avoided if certain measures were in place. Several contributing factors led to this unfortunate event. Firstly, the absence of guidelines, which are essential in cave diving, was a significant oversight. Secondly, the divers lacked the necessary formal training to navigate such treacherous conditions. Additionally, the absence of a redundant air supply was a crucial factor, as this could have provided the divers with the extra time they needed to escape the cave. Poor silt management was another contributing factor as the divers stirred up the silt, causing it to cloud the water and obscure their vision. Finally, the divers had no understanding or appreciation of the hazards associated with cave diving, which is a highly specialized and dangerous activity that requires proper preparation and equipment. This was the ninth cave diving marathon on this channel and the first Australia episode. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, Take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.